Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Deepan, and I'm one of the Advanced Heart Failure and Transplant Cardiology Fellow at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Very nice to meet you all virtually. I'm going to discuss an interesting case that I had last year where we had a patient with mitral regurgitation and cardiac amyloidosis with subsequent diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis. So brief background. Amyloidosis is a systemic disorder which involves abnormal protein deposition in various organs of the body, including the heart. If this deposition happens in the heart, it's called cardiac amyloidosis. The common associated features of cardiac amyloidosis, specifically the TTR variety, are carpal tunnel syndrome and lumbar spinal stenosis. Now, there are ways, as I mentioned, it's more common in TTR variety. There are different types of systemic amyloidosis. The two of them that are most common for our cardiac amyloidosis patients are light chain AL amyloidosis or TTR amyloidosis. Now, mitral regurgitation itself can happen in patients with cardiac amyloidosis, and this can happen because of excessive LVH and, and biatrial dilation which alters the geometry of the heart and by itself can cause mitral regurgitation. We describe a patient who had primary mitral regurgitation and he was subsequently diagnosed with ATTR cardiac amyloidosis. And this became very important in the immediate post-operative period as therefore hemodynamic compromise given patient had underlying cardiac amyloidosis. So brief about case, how he presented. It was a 73-year-old African-American male. He had a past medical history of hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, this becomes really important because a lot of times if somebody has LVH and has a history of hypertension, it might be attributed to just being hypertensive for some time. But our patient did have history of bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. He had had surgical procedures for carpal tunnel syndrome on both of his hands. He did have mitral regurgitation for about three to five years before presentation, and he was being regularly followed by serial echocardiograms. But this time he presented to the hospital uh, with NYHA class three heart failure symptoms for the last three months. His physical examination was significant for holosystolic murmur at the apex, which was radiating to the axilla, bilateral lower lung field crackles, and bilateral pedal edema. He achieved an echocardiogram, which showed severe mitral regurgitation, an EF, which was low normal of 55%, dilated left atrium, left ventricular hypertrophy, and mild to moderate tricuspid regurgitation. To add to it, it, his EKG did not have low voltage. His EKG was normal voltage. He did have coronary CT, which was done as part of a preoperative presentation for mitral valve surgery, which showed no significant CAD. So at this time, the decision was made that this patient has primary mitral regurgitation, which was evident by echocardiogram. It was severe. He was symptomatic and his EF was below 60%. So he did form in, into class one recommendation for mitral valve surgery. He did achieve mitral valve, primary mitral valve replacement with a 27 millimeter St. Jude epic porcine valve, as well as during the same surgery, he underwent tricuspid valve repair. Now during the surgery, the surgeons noticed that this patient has biventricular hypertrophy, not just left ventricle, but he also had right ventricle hypertrophy. And they ended up doing an endomyocardial biopsy, which was later, which was sent to pathology and later came back positive as TTR amyloid. Whereas his mitral valve, which was sent for pathology, also had myxoid degeneration. So he had both the things happening at the same point. But why amyloid became so important in this patient was that he had sustained cardiogenic shock in the immediate post-operative period, which required 21-day ICU stay. And he have like expectedly had a drop of EF after mitral valve repair to 36%. He did eventually improve. He was diagnosed with TTR amyloidosis based on his endomyocardial biopsy. 
He was started on tafamidus, which was the only approved therapy at that time. And it did improve his functional status. We also did a genetic testing because he was he was kind of on the borderline age. Now, genetic testing becomes really important because TTR variety of amyloidosis has further two subtypes. One of them is hereditary amyloido TTR, which has a genetic predisposition and runs in families. And the other one is wild type, which happens later on in the eighth to ninth decade of life. So this patient was negative for genetic workup, positive endomyocardial biopsy, hence confirming the diagnosis of wild type TTR. Now, important points what we learned in this patient was that you could have primary and even severe mitral regurgitation, but the more important part is that you could have underlying cardiac amyloidosis. Although we completely agree with the decision that was made by the outside hospital for, for primary mitral valve surgery, given symptoms of heart failure, severe mitral regurgitation, and a drop in ejection fraction to less than 60%. But it was very important and it were, and it became important in the later post-operative setting because patients with cardiac amyloid have a complex hemodynamic situation as their cardiac output is fixed and he had persistent low output cardiogenic shock in the immediate post-operative period, which did require a 21-day ICU stay. So this case is really important and it just is important because it signifies that earlier the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis, and even though we would have still sent him for appropriate surgery, which, which is again is debatable because we could have started him on tafamidus first and see if his symptoms improved. But even if we ended up sending him for surgery for primary mitral severe regurgitation, we could have prepared well in advance for the scenario of having low output state in the post-operative period and planning accordingly so that our anesthesia, our surgeons, our ICU team is already ready. Further, and the most important thing which I would like to bring about is that we need to spread this awareness that not all LVH is just hypertension mediated. We always need to think about these infiltrative diseases. And with growing age, there is increased prevalence or in, I would want to say like increased incidence of diagnosis of cardiac amyloid these days with better imaging techniques. And we have multiple therapies available now, which are available in market. Uh, before this talk, I, I actually checked on Google that tafamidus is available in India. and I'm sure you guys are using it. And again, we have to think about the symptoms that can happen with an LVH, like carpal tunnel syndrome, bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome that should be like a marker to at least think about amyloid, to look at your echo more closely, to think about doing further examination before sending somebody for surgery. And another thing is lumbar spinal stenosis, peripheral neuropathy. All these signs are present due to amyloid deposition in the neurological system, and we need to think about amyloid in such patients with LVH. Again, conclusions like I already discussed that you could have both mitral valve disorders and cardiac amyloidosis at the same time and a heightened index of suspicion is needed, especially in patients with LVH and systemic signs that I just talked about. And it's important to know about these situations because we can predict that our post-operative force is going to be rocky and our ICU team, our surgeons, our cardiac anesthetists could be well prepared for it. These are my references. Thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. I'm happy to answer any of your questions on my email address, which is opal.deepan at mayo.edu, or you can direct message me on X. My account is at the rate deepanopal. Thank you and have a great rest of your afternoon.